It's an honor to speak here today. That's how I started six years ago uh, in a similar circumstance. Uh, and I said then, it's always been an honor for me uh, because I'm talking about my mom. Uh, very much in the same way that I was talking about my dad. It's always been an honor. Um, growing up in Durham, New Hampshire, which is a small town, uh, when I was a kid, uh, I would talk to, I would meet adults. And at some point when a seven-year-old is talking to this adult, the, seven, the adult is thinking, who is this kid? And eventually they'll figure out, oh, that's Martha Burton's son. That's the David Burton's son. And I would always get a version of the same reaction. One reaction, if it was for my dad, they would say, David Burton, I love that guy. He is such a great guy. And then they might tell a story about him. Uh, with my mom, it was very similar. Um, women in particular, they would always say, Martha Burton, you know what? She is a really, really remarkable woman. She's a really remarkable woman. Um, Martha Burton, is really, without a doubt, the smartest person that I've ever met. Um, my, my, my dad, at, uh, living at home, he was a math professor, uh, always wore these uh, ratty uh, wool sweaters and uh, would uh, knock off complex mathematical equations with an easy, casual brilliance. My mom uh, had these very, very intricately knitted uh, complex sweaters, and she was the one with a razor sharp mind. Razor sharp. Uh, she was by far the smartest person that I've ever known, but she never ever treated anyone as though they weren't also the smartest person that she had ever met. Um, she never valued anyone any less. Um, when I was in middle school, there was one day when she took me downstairs and opened up an old shoe box and she uh, showed me her report cards from high school. Uh, and she said, this is what I expect you to do in high school. And I looked at them and I was like, I can't do that, I can't do that. I mean, because it was a string of A pluses, I, mean, I cannot do that. Uh, there is really only one Martha Burton. Um, and now she's gone. And uh, with, she was always the glue in our family. She was always the rock holding us all together. And uh, with such a powerful presence in our lives, I don't even know. We're a family that really is hurting right now um, to the point where I'm not even sure are we really even a family anymore? I mean, are we now a collection of individuals without the rock holding us together? Uh, what, what happens to our family? What happens to us? I mean, are we gonna have another Thanksgiving? What, what do we do at Christmas now? Uh, we just can't imagine a world without them. Uh, we're a family, sure, but it's, it feels like a family with its beating heart ripped out of it. Um, when we learn so much for so long from such a good source, it's so difficult to say goodbye, but we always do. Um, God may wash away all tears, but we're never to be spared those tears. Uh, we all have to walk that valley in the shadow of, uh, the, the, what, valley in the shadow of death. death. <laughs> uh, we, we don't have to walk it alone, but we all have to walk it. Um, and we learn that life is fleeting. We're all here on temporary loan. Uh, we're all here on a brief fleeting moment. Um, and we just heard from uh, First Corinthians, uh, St. Paul telling us uh, about what happens after death. Um, and it's nice, um, but in reality, he doesn't know. Uh, in another epistle, he says that we see as though through a glass darkly, um, which is true. Um, maybe I shouldn't say it in, in an Episcopal church, but, uh, but all religions are man-made constructs. 
Uh, they are an, an attempt for us human beings, as limited as we are, to try and understand the, the absolute ineffable. ineffable. Uh, and they're all going to fall short. We don't really know. We're all doing our best to figure it out. We're always inactive. But I was thinking about this the other week. Um, the one thing that all religions do have in common at its roots, we're all trying to understand God as best we can. The one thing that we all, they all have in common, and it's not God, because not all religions do have a God. The one thing that all religions have in common is that they all believe that all of us are connected with one great common soul. Our souls are not our own. They are all part of something larger. They're all part of something bigger. And we are all connected to each other. We all living beings, I wrote this down, that we all carry a supreme universal spirit within each other. And that, that divine spark is immortal, eternal, and unchanging. Our, so, our souls that we have, it's the same soul that you have, that you have, that you have. There's an English poet that said, I am he as you are he as you are me and we are all together. But we all have the same soul. So in that sense, Martha Beck Burton is not really God. Uh, in fact, she's in the person sitting next to you. So, I mean, if you think about it in that sense, I mean, death really doesn't have any sting because Martin, Martha Burton is not really lost. She's not really gone, she's here. I mean, and she's within me. I never have to wonder what she would think about something because it's right here. And, uh, and Martha, and, and uh, to play on that riff, I mean, uh, I mean, religions, all religions, especially Christianity, uh, they define sins as if you have the same soul as that person, that person, that person, and we are all connected in some way to something larger that we may call God, then if I am disrespecting someone or insulting someone, that is a sin. However, if I admire you and respect you and honor you, that is the same as, as, as admi uh, honoring God. That is what a virtue is. And that is really what defines Martha's view of the world. Uh, is love and respect for everyone. My mom wanted me to say that she could not abide selfishness and mean-spiritedness in any way, including in public life. She rejected this braying, chest-thumping form of politics that is like done by a seventh grade bully or a 62-year-old internet troll. Uh, she always could, she could not understand why people would choose to see other American citizens as having the worst possible motives of anything, rather than living up to their highest potential. Because our job is to show mercy, comfort the mourner, help the poor in spirit, and satisfy all those who seek justice. In the gospel reading that said, blessed are they who mourn, and we are a part of them. But in the, the Greek text, the word for mourning, it means anyone that knows what sorrow means. And mourning can take a whole lot of forms. When I was in fourth grade, my mom, Martha Burton, told me to stay away from people that were absolutely positively convinced that they were right. Because those people are dangerous. And I think that what she was trying to say was, uh, watch out for these people because they could be racists. They could be uh, probably racism because racism is a, a form of disrespecting the divine, divine spark that sit between you and me and other people and God. Um, my mother dedicated her entire life to helping other people reach their highest potential. I mean, I don't know how many people are in this room that she helped put through college, 
Um, and she opened at least three scholar, college scholarships that I can think of off the top of my head, maybe even more. Uh, she also, um, when I was a kid, uh, she spent her time at the Planned Parenthood Clinic in Dover, um, two or three times a week. Um, even as recently as about three or four weeks ago, uh, she um, would still tell the story about back in the 1950s when she was a college student. Um, she gathered up all the girls in her women's dorm to go downtown and talk to a, a physician about contraception. And to this day, or last month, I should say, she would still say, it's like, I got 10 girls on that bus, should have been the entire dorm. And she would shake her head, it should have been the entire dorm. Um, she uh, also ran the math center at UNH. Um, she helped kids get better. That was the purpose of it, help kids get better. And not necessarily even at mathematics. It's because she all believed that we could do better. And she would never, never let a student say that they, women in particular, she would never let a, a female student say that they couldn't do math. It's like, and she would say, it's like, come on, you can't be proud of being dumb. You, you want to go around and, and if you've had a severe concussion, okay, but no, you shouldn't be proud of being stupid. Uh, and she wouldn't accept that out of anyone. And one of the things that always drove me nuts when I was at, when I was in college or in high school and I couldn't get something figured out is she would always say, well, you didn't try hard enough. I mean, it, I mean, it drove me crazy. I mean, if, 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 something, if, I, if I did something accidentally, uh, well, it was an accident, but you didn't try hard enough to prevent it. So, so she, divided, she also dedicated her retirement years to being a court advocate for neglected and abused children, helping kids. She, uh, she would go out and talk to these kids if they didn't want to talk about their situation at home, that was fine. Uh, she would play a game of Monopoly or Clue, whatever they wanted. Uh, and the kids really loved her. I mean, because she treated them like kids, not some pawns in a divorce. They were just kids, uh, and, they, and they loved her for it. So Jesus gave that Sermon on the Mount, and that, there's, it's not an accident we had that as the gospel reading, because that's the way my mom whipped her life. Psalm 34 says that we should seek justice and pursue it. Amos says that we are supposed to let justice roll down like waters and righteousness come like an ever-flowing stream. Mercy, mercy and truth shall meet. Righteousness and peace, peace shall kiss each other. And Martha was a peacemaker. And that peace that we are supposed to do is not merely a cessation of war or violence, is to recognize the divinity that's between each one of us and to repair broken relationships in this human family. We are supposed to make this world a better place to be. Those who make peace are God's sons and daughters. God's sons and daughters are the ones that look most like him, the ones that most resemble him. The kingdom of heaven belongs to those that do the right thing despite opposition, it says rejoice and be glad. And if you look at the Greek text, the rejoice and be glad, it's a compound word that says to weep exceedingly, unbridled joy at unity with God. And that's what we have right now. Martha has passed into an immediate presence with God together with the sun, the moon, the stars, all different kinds of celestial bodies that give off light reflecting God's splendor. The waters, of Martha's soul are like a river. All water is the same. All water is the same. And Martha Beck Burton has passed that water in her river onto three different tributaries where it may go on, who knows? Uh, but the water in her soul has flowed downstream. 
The water in all these rivers is the same, but it flows out eventually into the vast watery deep of the bottomless ocean where it meets all other water. This vast watery bottomless deep you, where all of us come together and we may call it God. But eventually we're all gonna return someday. Whether we return as the morning dew, the afternoon gentle shower, or the midnight thunderstorm, we all come down again as water and form new rivers. So the reason why we had the Beatitudes is that we are supposed to go forward, do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the orphan and fight for the widow's cause, just the way Martha Burton did, and make today a brighter day for someone else, make New Hampshire a better place to be, make America closer to the ideal that it was always supposed to be, the kindly, generous land that it was supposed to be. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of grain, for the purple mountain's majesty above a fruited plain. America, America, may God shed his grace on thee and bound thy good with sisterhood <laughs> from sea to shining sea. Thanks be to God.
Maybe you've heard stories about settling into Durham and raising my mom and my aunt and my uncle here. Maybe you've heard stories about Kona, Freya, Loki, Fletcher, or any of the other dogs that she's had over the years. Stories about how she co-founded the Deadwood Society and then joined the Conservation Board at St. Thomas. About how she taught students at the UNH Math Center, more importantly, provided some necessary pastoral care and gave real help to, to young people. Maybe you heard about how she taught herself basic computer programming. That was a favorite story that she was talking about. <laughs> Pearl, right? Uh, maybe you would hear about how she volunteered as a children's advocate. Um, these stories and more were all told over numerous cups of coffee with way too much sugar in the afternoons after lunch. So I'm sitting here trying to think of which stories to tell. Um, and I thought that maybe we heard some of these stories today. Um, or not even just today, but just in general, we've, we've heard them. Except for maybe that there's a few stories that we haven't all heard. Those would be the ones from the final days. So I wanted to just tell a couple of those from, from last night. I thought that I would do so in the hopes of bringing comfort and a spark of recognition. My grandmother prayed for justice. A couple of days after she was admitted to the hospital last month, I went to her home to pick up a couple of comfort items to bring to her. Things like clothes, books, and photos, etc. On her coffee table, I discovered her book of common prayer, um, some of the prayers that we learned today from that page. It had a bookmark in it, and I opened it the page and to the page with the bookmark and found that she had been praying to, praying to the courts or for the courts of justice that day. That was the week that Katanji Brown Jackson was going through the confirmation hearings for a seat in the Supreme Court. Um, my grandmother was admitted the day before the confirmation in Toronto, so she didn't know. So I legally, well, not legally, but you know, happily returned to the hospital and had the privilege of telling her that Justice Jackson had been confirmed to the court that day. Hearing this, she sat up, smiled broadly, and said to me, See, if you just stay here long enough and live for long enough, you get to watch real progress happen. My grandmother prayed for justice. But she also worked in service to it her whole life. She supported numerous young people in pursuit of education. She was a teacher and a tutor, working with literally thousands of people, training them in mathematics, but also sponsoring the scholarships that I've mentioned, assisting family and friends, and by opening her home to young people as they studied or received tutoring after going into it. My grandmother generally had this knack. She had an incredible knack for finding projects and taking people under her wing and helping them in small but very meaningful ways, or sometimes not so small. Um, whatever problem, project, or predicament appeared before her, the first question my grandma always asked was, well, what can I do to help? And she was also not a shy person. Many of us can, we probably know stories about how she'd march into the town, town office, one of her favorite places to go, um, into the dean's office, into the police station, into the municipal building, the fire station, what have you. Usually, she would do these things, she would do this march with questions about how to best help out someone that she cared about. One time, she helped a student who was experiencing harassment um, at UNH to file a police report, walking them through the process. It turned out that that police officer was also a former student of hers, and Matt, don't tell anyone. <laughs> but a couple of years later, that same police officer pulled my grandmother over for doing a very, very bad thing on the road. Um, and remembering her kindness, he let her off with a warning. My grandmother's stories often had a way of illustrating, like this story does, how showing people grace was not merely its own reward, but that that grace would compound over time if you let it. My grandmother's interest in justice shaped my life in important ways. For instance, when my cousin Simone and I were kids, my grandmother taught us each how to bake. But, and this is important, she also taught us how to calculate compound interest. <laughs> <laughs> yes, compound interest in particular, right? Um, and if you ask, if you ask her why girls, girls needed to know how to calculate compound interest, she would tell you, it's because I want you to be rich. Um, but the real reason was justice. When she was a young woman, a new mother, when my grandmother was a young woman, women could not legally get credit cards or even have bank accounts in their own name. When I was 13, I thought that I was getting a simple math lesson, and I sort of presented it. That's what I was doing. 
Um, but this was more than just an math lesson. It was an investment in my autonomy as a woman. It was an investment that was made even more precious because my grandmother readily recalled a time when girls and women could not access that kind of autonomy. It wasn't that long ago. I looked it up in 1974. Um, she applied the same ethic, the same ethic of justice and, and acting in it, to her politics, to her stance in reproductive justice, to her Episcopal faith, to her contributions to this community here at St. Thomas, and to women in faith in general. She was a person who devoted herself to promoting the kind of progress that she wanted to see in the world. And she bettered the lives of so many people, doing so in quiet but significant ways, without ostentation, um, but with real, meaningful, lasting impact. So, I, I have one final story I want, I want you all to hear. Um, and it doesn't really take the form of a, of a plot based story, but it's sort of it's some of the things that my grandmother um, said to me to family members, to friends, to people who visited her in the hospital. And I thought that those of you who, um, there, are, there are people here who might want to hear what she had to say before her transition on Easter morning. Asked what she wanted to tell to her communities, she would say things like, I have had a wonderful life. I have not at all. I have been proud to know you all. Thank you. And I couldn't ask for anything more. She told us that she was ready, that she was not afraid. She held her children's hands. She got moments with several visitors, and she had a Zoom call with a very cherished friend. She even had a couple final, final rounds of coffee, and even though I didn't think in time to bring those little girl tea cups, her coffee was still way too sweet. And she continued to share her stories with us and with all the people who loved her until it was time to go. I don't think it's really possible in the space of the eulogy for me to talk about what my grandmother meant to me. I don't think any of us could do that. But if there's one thing I think we think about today, or one thing I ask people to think about, it's to think about the stories she told you and what they really meant, why, why it meant something for her to share them. Thank you. Family has talked about Martha. Ed, I need to have you write more theology for me. <laughs> you did. That needs to be my future funeral theological base, but we will talk about that another time. Martha was not only special to the family that grieves her today and that will, with God's help, find their way forward. Will, with God's help, find their way to remember that, albeit maybe in a different way, that their rock may be gone from the way that they know her, but that their rock, as was said, lives within each and every one of you. We all have our stories here at St. Thomas, I said, to Stacy earlier, so many families don't realize that their parents, if they're lucky, have communities, and for many of them it may be communities of faith, it may be the Women's Library Club, but in the communities where your families live, so often they have their own communities. And for Martha, St. Thomas, she was so important to us, and we like to believe we were important to her. I too could go on and tell you many stories. Um, I will only tell you two. One of them was uh, the fact, as Stacy said, and I think it is important for you to hear, I was one of the lucky ones that got to be with her often at the end. And when I asked her what I, she wanted me to say, she said the same thing Stacy said. She said, I've had a wonderful life. I've been so lucky. I said, Martha, are you afraid? And she looked at 
completely in that look she used to give. Many of us, I found out, I feel so much better now. Uh, she said, look, she would give me like, what are you talking about? No, Sue, what would I have to be afraid of? And I said, nothing. I just thought I asked. Sometimes at this stage in people's journey, ministers ask these questions. She's like, well, you're doing a very good job, but no. <laughs> Martha would inevitably come into lectionary. She was, and I, I, will, I need to say first off, like, let's name it. During COVID, there were some people, especially of certain ages, that were very resistant to technology and said things like, over my dead body or when hell freezes over. Martha was at the front of the parade, both emotionally, spiritually, and financially, saying, come on, St. Thomas, we can do this, and thanked me profusely, presumed. But when we would meet, she would come on, and she would come on, and the sound was horrific. And it would be like, Wah! And you know that feeling when you're on a Zoom meeting, when you just, it was like, and, and over and over again, she, I would say, Martha, I'll buy you headphones. I'll bring them over. I will wear a, a, I will wear a hazmat suit, but we will get you head I do not need headphones. This is, this, uh, my children have talked to me. I have learned how to do this correctly, and it is only you that hears that. <laughs> and I just decided it must be only me. Since met, I have since spent time with all of her children, and it wasn't. But, Martha said to me at the end, I am blessed. I have had a wonderful life. She did things like we have a parishioner here today who has grown children that are both very successful. And when one of her daughters was in sixth grade, apparently there was a thing called the problem of the week. This is a very educated family, but the sixth grader came home and was like, I have no clue. This parishioner knew Martha and called her up. Martha said, write it. She wrote it down. She said, give me a few minutes and I will call you back. And she called her back, started to tell the parent the solution to the problem. And the parent quickly said, I need you to talk to my daughter. I don't know what you're talking about. This young woman is now an engineer and their relationship through over the years, just one of many stories where Martha met this person where we were. Martha was amazing. And I am grateful for the opportunity to have known her, to have studied with her, to have prayed with her and laughed with her and talked politics with her. I am grateful for the opportunity I've walked this journey with her. There are so many things we could all say, but I think one of the things that we all need to remember, and certainly my theology, is that Martha is here with us today. She lives on in us in all those stories and in all the things that you hear in your head. And that we know that Jesus is the life, death, and resurrection. And on the last visit that I had with Martha, where she was able to have a conversation, I said to her, you know, and when she said, I just hope this doesn't drag out too long, this is impractical on the medical bills, this is a ridiculous waste of money, this just needs to come to an end. And I said, Martha, this is one of those things in your life you're just not going to be able to control. Like, your body and God have a plan, and it is going to be. I said, you know, but many people go home around Easter. She looked at me with that twinkle in her eye. Then she said, are you sure? Really? I said, Martha, this may be the only thing I know that you know. She said, so people really die on Easter? Like, that would be really wonderful. I said, they do. It's kind of a, it just happens, I don't know. I did not think when I was with her on Saturday that she would make it to Easter. But I, as always, as always, underestimated both God and Martha. And so when I got to church that morning and I was preparing for Easter service, I got the text, Martha has gone home. At 
believe it was 723, something like that, on Easter morning, and I just cried in joy because she knew, she knew she was ready to go home. She was ready, she wasn't afraid. And if there is ever an Easter sermon where we know that we can uh, live and love God in our life, it is the life, uh, death, and whatever resurrection means, Martha, help us to continue to learn as I know you will.